ஆமிஸ்தீவாஹிதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீதீ
hasanas and it will become easier for us. So it is important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us this opportunity to get another month of Ramadan, inshallah. And for those who do not have Iman, we pray that more and more people turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the month of Ramadan so they can also enjoy the blessings of this month, inshallah. Today, I want to share you the wisdom of those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also loves them in return. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He loves them and they love Him. <coughs> Clearly stating that it's Allah who loves us first and He's waiting for us to love back. And from then, I want to, do, to talk about the four essential elements of Islamic spirituality which I would like you to focus on during the month of Ramadan. These four essential elements of spirituality are Tawbah, Ikhlas, Zikr and Muhabbah. Tawbah, Ikhlas, Zikr and Muhabbah. Muhabbah or love is like a destination but it is more than that. That is what we want to achieve in our life. The relationship that we want to develop with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately is the one where we love and He loves us. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves someone, the entire cosmos and angels love too. So that is a destination, but it is also a state of being, it is a heart. It is a state of being. It is a, 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 it's like the complete opposite of the most stressful period that you can imagine in your life. So it is a hal, it is a state of your spirituality. If we had an instrument by which we could measure the state of our heart, then that love is when you are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. Allah is with us, He's closer to us than our jugular way. We just have to reciprocate. So at the end of this month, inshallah, after our prayers, after our fasting, after our zakat, our charity, our ibadah, one of the ways in which we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that He loves us is through doing nawafi. This is where you have to step up. You have to really step up your game, so to speak, in the month of Ramadan. Whatever you were doing in pursuit of Allah, double it, triple it, quadruple it. For two reasons. It's like you're riding a bike and during the 11 months you're either riding uphill or you're riding straight. Now you have the opportunity to ride downhill so you can really go fast. Come as close up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as possible. Zikr and Tawbah are like processes. They are things that we do. And Ikhlas is a posture. Ikhlas is an attitude of your mind and of your heart. Ikhlas is a very interesting concept. Most people will translate it as sincerity. When we aspire, Ikhlas is to bring sincerity in our heart. The famous hadith, if your migration was for Allah, then it is for Allah. If your migration was to marry someone, then it is for them. Amal bin niya go to intentionality. So ikhlas is the purification of your intention. It is the purification of your life. Why do you worship? If you give charity to become famous, then inshallah you will become famous. But you are even, God owes you nothing. If your ibadah are so that people around your community tell you that wow, what a wonderful person you are, then congratulations, they will say that. And if they do, then you are done. You got what you wanted, and Allah was enough. So it's very important to purify your intention. And the only way you can purify your intentions is through constant murahaba, constantly questioning yourself. Why do I do this? Am I doing this to look good? Am I doing this to become famous? Am I doing this to become rich? Am I doing this to take revenge against other people that I do not like? It is very important. If you're doing it for anything but Allah, then don't do it. It is not worth doing. Sleep. Literally, do wudu and go to sleep. That is like a bad 
because you're in the state of voodoo and you're doing nothing. So this is very important. But ikhlas is not just intention because we have something in the Quran called Surah Ikhlas which is also called Surah of Tawheed. So in many ways, ikhlas and Tawheed are connected. So purity of intention is also close to believing in monotheism or unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is, this is where the profound aspect of ikhlas comes in. Now these are topics which are very big. I mean, just talking about Surat al-Ikhlas, I could spend a whole night just talking about Qulhu Allahu Ahad, Nallahu Samad, Nam Yalit, Nam Yulad, Nam Yakunahu Kufu. This is also a class. What does it mean? Our purity of intention is inseparable from our Aqidah or our Shahada. But Zikr, you all know, everything that you do to remember God is Zikr. Salah is a form of Zikr. Quran is a self-called Zikr. When you recite the Quran, it's Zikr. The more you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the closer you go to Him. When you perform Salah, you're performing Zikr. When you're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing Zikr. When you're reciting His names, you're doing Zikr. When you're doing Mustafar, you're doing Zikr. Even when you're seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your sins, you're doing Zikr. When you're doing Nasiha to younger people, to your friends, giving them good advice, it is also a form of Zikr. This is very important. The more zikr you do, the less sins you commit. The more zikr you do, the less sins you commit. And the more zikr you do, the more you purify yourself. But today I want to talk to you a bit more about tawbah. Tawbah is, I think, the first step. In a very famous hadith, hadith of Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually says that when my servant walks towards me, I run towards him. When my servant remembers me in his heart, I remember him. When my servant talks about me in public. But in that he also says, when a servant takes a step towards me, I take four steps towards him. So what is this first step that you can take towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that the first step is of tawbah. The first step is of tawbah. Often times, for a lot of us who don't think in Arabic, who don't speak and don't think in Arabic, we translate this to equivalent words in English or some other language. And half the time, we lose a lot in translation. But sometimes, the essence is lost in translation. You understand? That is the scary part that the spiritual essence of the concept could be lost through translation. So even though Islam is for all people, for all people, it is very important for us as practicing Muslims to fully understand the Islamic con concepts. And Tawbah is one important one. Most people will translate Tawbah as repentance. But repentance is just one aspect of Tawbah. Tawbah in Arabic literally means to turn, to turn, to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to turn your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one who turns people's hearts. In a beautiful ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, the ayah is the 39th of Surah al mayr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. فَمَنْ تَعَ مِنْ بَعْدِ ظُلْمِهِ فَأَصْلَحَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَتُوبُ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ In this ayah, in the same ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the concept of tawbah in the two different ways in which we should understand it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ تَعَ مِنْ بَعْدِ ظُلْمِهِ He who returns, or he who feels remorse, or he who feels repents after committing sin. If he who returns for aslaha and reforms himself, indeed Allah yatubu alayhi as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and again the same word, Allah turns towards him. So in this I realize that tawbah is a state in which both the believer and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are doing tawbah. If you understand tawbah as just seeking forgiveness, then you will misunderstand. 
When you do Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also does Tawbah. You will seek forgiveness and He turns towards you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ يَتُوبُ عَلَيْهِمْ Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now turns towards the servant of his who is seeking forgiveness because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ghafur Rahim. He is, you know all understand Rahim, he is merciful, compassionate, benevolent, but a Ghafur. He is one who forgives again and again. He is often forgiving. The word of Ghafur and Ghafur is not just to forgive. He is one who forgives you again and again and again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You cannot despair if you are a Muslim. Even if your sins are higher than the mountains, bigger than this entire earth, if you return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you do tawbah, return, He will forgive you. On Jummahs, I perform a small ritual of tawbah. I try my best to come here as early as possible and often our dear brother Mausen beats me to it. I come here at least 10 to 15 minutes early pray two rakahs to greet the Masjid. And then I pray two rakahs asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help for this khutbah. And in the period, the 5-10 minutes I do, I try to detox myself which is my head is full of thousand things politics I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do this before Salah, after Salah, tomorrow, day after tomorrow lots of things like all of us lots of things are going towards our mind not only that I'm also addicted to various sports through so different scores, matches, scores, all of this is going through your head at least the music has stopped now I don't, music doesn't stick in my head, I start doing, listening to music generally but that is important. So you sit down there for five, ten minutes and try to detox and get all these things out so that I can now do ruchu, tawajju towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I realized today that that is tawbah. See, that is important. I'm not seeking forgiveness for a specific sin. But what I'm doing is turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm doing tawbah. So in that sense, the month of Ramadan is the month of Tawbah. This is the month of Tawbah that is coming so that we can all turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can detox our soul. We can detox our mind. We can detox our culture, our attitudes, our politics, our postures towards everything and turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look at the Shari'i concept of Tawbah, there are three things that a scholar will tell you that you need to do if you successfully want to do tawbah. Number one, you should... But they tie this concept of tawbah to a specific sin. You've done something wrong. Now you're seeking tawbah from Allah. So now tawbah is understood in terms of seeking forgiveness. The Prophet ﷺ himself used to minimum say astaghfirullah 70 times a day. And he said this in a tradition, even I seek forgiveness from Allah. And many of the Sahaba said, we have actually heard him say Astaghfirullah more than 70 times, even hundreds of times at a time. But we tie the concept from the Shari perspective to a sin. If you've committed something wrong, you've lied, you've stolen something, I don't know what. And the three things you have to do for your Tawbah to be valid and accepted. Number one, you feel genuine remorse in your heart. You feel that you have done something wrong. That is the beginning of tawbah. If you don't feel it, if your dad is scolding you and then you do tawbah, it doesn't work that way. The first step of tawbah is to acknowledge and recognize and feel. It's not just a mental exercise. You recognize, okay, I did something wrong. But if in the back of your head you have justification such that, oh, I didn't have any other choice, this is the most pragmatic option, etc., then it is not tawbah. It has to be genuinely heartfelt sense of remorse. The second step is that you abstain from it forever. For example, let's say you had a glass of alcohol. Now you are doing tawbah. So you feel guilty that, oh my God, I indulge in an act which is haram. May Allah forgive me. I stuck for Allah. The next thing is to abstain from it. It means you do not do it again 
and resolve, make this determination not to do it ever again. So, you feel remorse, you decide, I will never do it again, and you never do it again, and the only thing that you know that your tawbah is complete is when you die. Until then, you are in a state of tawbah. Now, these are when you violate the hukuk Allah, but when you violate hukuk al-nas, when you commit a crime against another person, there is an additional element that you need to do to do, complete your tawbah. You feel remorse, you feel repentance, you develop a resolve never to do. It's a lot of arts in this tawbah. But there is another element when other people are involved and that is rectification. You have to make amends to the crime that you have committed. You accidentally kill somebody. Take care of their family. You accidentally broke somebody's car. Fix it. Pay for it. That is rectification. That is not enough for Tawbah, but that is legally enough. So this is an important part of it. But these are all externalities of Tawbah. There is an internal aspect of Tawbah, and that is what I also want to share with you. So from an external perspective, Tawbah is about returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, feeling remorse for the sins you have committed, repenting that you committed these sins, making the resolve that you will never do it again, and if it has hurt anybody, you rectify these sins, etc. But from an internal perspective, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَأَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that all of you moments, all of you believers, return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala collectively, Jameen, all of you, so that you may be successful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, this is actually the 31st ayah of Surah Al-Nur, it is in the end. Most people don't pay attention because it's all about, that's a highly politicized ayah about hijab, etc. So they focus on the beginning part of the ayah. The last part of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all of you who believe, turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you may be successful and tie tawbah to success. So which means that in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot be successful unless you do tawbah. I want to share the story of, of a, a gambler and a Sufi. This guy was basically a good guy. But one day he went to a place, the only place in his city which we serve good tea. So those of us who come from tea drinking countries, we know that there is no good tea in this country. So he goes to a nice place, with a good chai is served. And while he's having chai there, he sees that there are slot machines around the building. He says, let me try this. What order is it? And he plays and plays and he continues to gamble for a long time. Spends the whole afternoon there, wins hundreds of dollars and comes out. But he is basically a good man, had good upbringing, was connected to the masjid, used to pray, used to fast. And the moment he comes out of that, this house of temptation, he feels remorse and guilt in his heart. And he feels very sad and he doesn't know what to do. He runs to his sheikh and says, Sheikh, I did this. The sheikh is very upset. The sheikh said, well, you know what you need to do? First, all the winnings on your profits, donate that in charity. Maybe you can give it to the Khana Khan the Masjid. But give it away. It's haram, the money. Give it away. Give it to some poor people, etc. And don't ever go back there again. Because if you go back there, and then this tawbah of yours will fail. So this good man does the same thing. He throws away all his wins from the gambling and never returns to it. Now he's a few months later, he loses his job, he's looking for a job. And he applies for the job, the job for a food inspector. And the, the county manager wants to interview him in that same restaurant. So he has no choice. So he goes to that restaurant and then he gives an interview. After the interview, the manager goes away. This guy is again tempted by the slot machines. He goes and plays the slot machines again for several hours. He comes out, now this time he's lost lots of money, he's not won anything. 
he feels very remorseful and he goes back to his shaykh and shaykh says, how can you do this? All the tarbiyah that I have given you doesn't seem to be working. Your tawbah is now, the tawbah that is sought for your first thing is now announced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to punish you for the first one and the second one. Because when you repeat the sin, the forgiveness for the first one is announced. So go back and do tawbah and do remorse and for God's sake never ever go back there again. So he decides not to go. But he gets the job. He's school inspector. He has to go back there again at least once a year to check his kitchen. He goes there again a year later. Checks the kitchen. It's all good. As he's stepping out, he hears the slot machines. He's back there all day playing. He goes out. Now this time he's comfortable. He goes to his chef. Chef says, there's no salvation for you. Get lost. I don't even want you to come and hang around with my murid. You will corrupt the rest of them. God has forsaken you. He's not accepting your tawbah again and again and again. He says in the Quran that you can't see in all your life and at the end of your life seek tawbah. Allah is not going to grant you tawbah. Just a truth. The test of a genuine tawbah is if you have actually not lived on this resolve. So he goes away. That night, the Shaykh had a spiritual experience. He dreams that somebody comes to him in his dream and says, Who are you to come between me and my servant? Are you God? When you told your murid that he will not be forgiven, you committed shirk. And shirk of the highest order. You didn't associate somebody else with God. You thought you were God. I have promised to my servants that I will forgive them again and again and again. You need to repent and the way you shall repent is never ever advise anybody again. Abu Huraira, he is in which he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him who does tawba more than somebody who has lost their camel in the desert while they are hungry and thirsty. According to Ayyub and Sari, the Sahaba who's, those of you who are lucky enough to go to Istanbul can go to his place outside city. He narrated this incredibly amazing tradition in hadith in which he said that Prophet ﷺ said that if you all stop committing sins, if you all stop committing sins, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will exterminate you and replace you with people who commit sins and ask for forgiveness. Okay, this is mind-blowing. That's why these verses in the Quran constantly end with saying Inna Allah Ghafoorur Rahim because it doesn't make sense to it beyond our capacity to understand how forgiving and how compassionate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. That's why he tends to reiterate to us that he is so forgiving and so compassionate. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, I, I want you to go home and study. It's easy to remember. Two, 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 two. There's four twos. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 222. Remember this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Inna Allah yuhubbu tawwabin wa yuhubbu mutah, mutah, <laughs> mutatahhirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who repent. Loves those who repent. So those from that hadith that you get, that is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying that if people don't sin, there will be no one who will do tawbah. So this is very important. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all the opportunity to seek forgiveness. <coughs> Our Allah is Ghafur Rahim. Turn towards Him. The month of Ramadan is the month of turning. Turn towards Allah, He will turn towards you. This is really, really important. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulullah.
Dear brothers and sisters, nearly a year ago, on the 9th of May, our hearts were all broken and our dear brother Jamil Turk passed away. Jamil Turk was an important founding member of our community. He was clearly a founding father of the Muslim community of Delaware. If anyone were to write a comprehensive history of how the Delaware community developed institutionally, there will have to be a chapter, if not in the first chapter itself, that we talk about Jamil Turk. May Allah forgive his sins. May Allah give him the greatest place in Jannah. Uh, there is not a masjid in Delaware, at least that existed till 2016, which had not got help from Brother Jamil Turk, either through fundraising or getting permission from the county. He worked really hard in trying to help develop massages. He also worked as an interfaith dialogue person. He also worked as someone who brought people of different ethnic communities within the Muslim community together. He was popular with the Turks, he was popular with South Asians, and he was obviously the leader and darling of the Arab community. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives the greatest of blessings to Brother Jamil Turk. I also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that even though his place is something that cannot be filled, I hope that many of the young people here who are inspired by stories like him, inspired to do service, to step forward and try to do more. Brother Jamil Turk wanted to engage in politics. He saw that he had done a lot for the Muslim community. Now he wanted to serve the entire Delaware community and I think it's time somebody took the baton from him and ran forward. So I invite young people to step forward and play the role that Jamil Turk used to play. Uh, إن الله يعمر بالأجل والإحسان وإيتاج القربى وينهى الفشى والمنكر والبقي يعيزكم لأنكم تذكرون وقيموا الصلاة